Okay, hello everyone, how are you? So we just finished with the famous, what they call the lion's roar of the silence of the Malakirti. Now, how on earth can they say a silence is a lion's roar? This is what we have to consider. And uh, as I think I said at the end of the previous session, that uh, many papers were written in my teaching, 50 year teaching career, by students trying to differentiate the silence of Vimalakirti, which liberated many people, and the silence of, of Shariputra, a few chapters earlier when talking to the goddess, where she simply said, Now come on, Shariputra, you're just being silent when you're supposed to answer the question. <laughs> and, and that was so it was like, and he said, do, She said, Do not point to nirvana by, by, or enlightenment by abandoning speech. The very nature of speech is neither internal nor external nor anywhere in between, and the very nature of nirvana is neither internal or internal nor anywhere in between, and therefore the nature of, very nature of speech is nirvana. So in other words, no big deal remaining silent. So what's the difference? So clearly, what it is is Shariputra. I'm answering for you all. I'm not assigning you a paper, <laughs> term paper. So I'm answering for giving you the answer. And there may be, it's like a Zen koan. Maybe there is no ultimate answer because it's all in the realm of inconceivability, finally. But anyway, on the, on the um, rational, conventionally rational level, the answer is, Shariputra had achieved the kind of nirvana that the arhat achieves in the in the Theravada or the you know the non-dual I mean the dualistic type of Buddhist teaching, where the Buddha lets people believe that nirvana is going to be somewhere else than in the world of samsara, the world of differentiated things, the world of self and other, and so forth. And so Shariputra has had an experience. Being in a vast realm, which was free of any duality in the sense that it was all just one realm, and he was not separate as part of it. He was he was the whole realm, and it was so so intense and so much what he expected the absolute to be that he kind of dropped out from thinking about the fact that it was a state or place or or, or situation that was different than the one he'd been in before. So therefore, there was a boundary between it and something else, and therefore, it couldn't be the absolute. So he, but he didn't have that, that reason with him, and he just felt canceled on any kind of discursive or conceptual thought. And then, But then, for some reason, he somehow felt himself residually present back in the world after some time, which didn't seem to be much time because nothing was happening in that state of bliss that he was in. And it was blissful. It was not a nothing state. It was not unconscious. It was a blissful state, like a clear light type of state. And yet, he was back, like regular Shariputra. And then the Theravadan people nowadays have a thing, it's like a fan the electricity of ignorance and egotism has been turned off, but the blades keep go whirling by momentum. So the Theravada Arhat, or the Hinayana Arhat, feels that they're just around as a kind of piece of momentum, and that they'll naturally subside back into this bliss state. And in a way, they feel very near to the bliss state, so they're very saintly. And yet, there still is that difference. And remember that Vimalakirti, when he challenged Shariputra at the very beginning in Shariputra's own account, when Shariputra was meditating, and obviously in meditating he was going back, if not into a nirvanic state, very close to it. But Vimalakirti said, Shariputra, do not meditate this way. You should meditate in such a way that neither body nor mind appear anywhere in the triple universe or the triple realms. Three realms being desire realm, pure form realm, pure matter realm, 
pure material realm and immaterial or formless realm. And in a way where he was, was like in something like the fourth formless state, which is neither, neither unconscious nor conscious in a conceptual way, which is kind of clear light-like. And yet it is not the complete clear light where you're completely one with it, and yet it is still supporting the complete universe. So then you bring your feeling of infinite bliss back into your relationships with everything, if you can imagine it, which it is inconceivable. You can't, because it is the absolute. You are in it, but you already are in it now. Okay? So it's possible to be in it and not know you're in it. <laughs> and then it's possible to be in it and know you're in it. And then the question is, how do you know it? Because you're pure transparency and it's pure transparency. So somehow you're just there. And I have a new theory for it. It's very radical. And I, if I got onto a debating floor in one of the Tibetan monasteries, I'm sure I'd get wasted. <laughs> but I think it's correct, actually. Because, you know, there is this duality between direct experience and indirect experience, which is inferential, which is still operating with some sort of conceptuality. So if by inference you know that you're in clear light because when you go unconscious and you have done so a zillion times of falling asleep in this life alone, and not only that, you died in previous lives, completely going unconscious in the process of dying, and yet you're still here. So by inference, the base of reality is not nothingness, or you wouldn't be here because nothing would remain nothing. <laughs> and but you are here, which you, and you can't be something and nothing at the same time, because then it would have no meaning among the somethings. And so something and void of non-relative, essential absolutes, which is what the voidness means, emptiness means, which means here in complete relativity, and yet and fully transparent with all everything else in the relativity, and yet seeing it as an illusion interconnected with you, and therefore completely blissful in it no matter what else happened. Because it is infinite bliss. So you are the life force, says the Buddha. You are everyone's health. You are infinite health, if you will, the health of the universe. That's the nirvana. That's what nirvana is. Without destroying the universe. It's the health of the universe. It's the life force of the universe. It's the infinite energy which is quiescent on its own. It doesn't want to impose on anybody or anything. It doesn't create things. The people not knowing it creates them being in a state of struggle. And knowing it gives them the ability to help them get out of the state of struggle into bliss, not into unconscious nothingness. Okay, so Shariputra was not was silent and mentally pointing to a place he was where he thought other people were not. So in a way, he was confirming their sense of not being blissful, of not being free, which is based on their ignorance. You're following the difference? Vimalakirti, on the other hand, when it was his moment and when people were expecting him as an authority because of his miraculous abilities and his great eloquence and teaching abilities and so on, his like Manjushri-like qualities, they were expecting him to say something that would really flip them out. And so they were open to what's the ultimate non-duality door. And he basically focused on seeing them and himself already there in the non-duality. So they felt suddenly seen as freer than they fa had been feeling themselves in a powerful way. And therefore, the way they saw themselves was a little less unfree temporarily. And therefore, it's to say that this in person at that level attained the next level up, you know, in some sort of openness. They kind of, because they felt embraced in his openness. And the fact that, which, he, which is only his, his kind of confirming their innermost openness, their Buddha natures, their Buddha soul, their soul nature, not their conscious personality, dualistic, you know, delusion-driven nature. 
Do you get the difference? One is confirming our state as we are, not enlightened. One is confirming a kind of essential openness and enlightenment, which again is not an absolute absolute. It's only our openness to the infinite relativity absolute. Okay, which, but which, which again, you know, none of that can be defended ultimately in dualistic language because it's inexpressible in dualistic language. Okay, but, I, but one can still strive using inference, rational inference, that's the beauty of it. The beauty of those great teachers, of those beings who are one with the indivisible, and, that, and therefore indivisible with us, that they can find what is our purchase toward wisdom, which within conventionality is reason. Not just some blank experience, because blank experience will, will not relieve us. It will temporarily quiet and suppress, but it will not relieve us from a deeply ingrained instinctual conceptuality which will still imprison us in, in the dualism of self versus other. Is that, that, is that meaning, meaning? Main point is, is it meaningful to you? Not is it domineering and compelling to you? Because in fact, reason ultimately, for when it's syllogism for another, or when it's a reason for another, when you're thinking clearly yourself, it's reasoning for yourself. When you express it to another, it's, it's a syllogism, and it's expressed for another in this beautiful tool <clears throat> with limitations, but nevertheless beautiful, which is language, the word. And ultimately, it depends on the person receiving that reasoning or being exposed to that reasoning, deciding to make the inference themselves. It, you know, reason doesn't dominate the other person to force them to adopt a certain conclusion. It only gives them the opening to do so. So reasoning is not indoctrination or, or just, you know, brainwashing, not at all. And so the beauty of it is that the love can express itself in a way as being meaningful to the other being, not as being compelling, but as being meaningful. And that is the way in which a Buddha teaches. And, and one who is supremely, who is as much the interlocutor, who is just as much the delusion person as his own person, because he's both, then he can make the best reason, open the doorway the best way for the other. And in the case of Vimalakirti's silence, to come back to that, he was opening the door for all of those present, the 32 bodhisattvas and all the gods and all the supernormal beings and everyone, so that just wherever they were able of using something reasonable, you know, feeling confident in the presence of one who themselves was indivisible from them, which they would, might not have expressed it that way, they might have been capable, not have been capable of doing it, but f relating to them in the fullest possible way where you are both sides of the relationship equally, and you equalize them both. So he was offering equality of himself, an enlightened person, with the unenlightened person, which helped them, helped them, his presence did automatically, which helped them find the enlightened part of themselves, to put it, to again go about again. Anyway, and after that strenuous <laughs> experience of being in the transparency with him, he fed them. And that's chapter 9, or 10 in the old version, uh, nine in the, in the in the my published version. There are nine in all the other versions. It's called the feast brought by the emanated incarnation. Remember, he sent out a gopher, a magically and miraculously created gopher, who went to this other universe and brought back this great food. Oh, actually, he does it here. Okay, so I'll read that now. Okay, so I'll read now. Thereupon, atta. The Venerable Shariputra thought to himself, if these great bodhisattvas do not adjourn before noontime, when are they going to eat? He's, he's very kind, Shariputra. He's worrying about them. The Lichavivimalakirti, aware of what the Venerable Shariputra was thinking, spoke to him, Reverend Shariputra, 
the Tathagata has taught the eight liberations. You should concentrate on those liberations, listening to the Dharma with a mind free of preoccupation with material things. Just wait a minute, Reverend Shariputra, and you will eat as much food as you have never before tasted. And so in other words, he doesn't give him a whole hard time like he did about the chairs. Remember a few chapters earlier. He just says, you're going to have good food, don't worry, and don't worry about it. Stick, stick on the eight liberations. All right. Then the Lichavi Vimalakirti set himself in a concentration and performed such a miraculous feat that those bodhisattvas and those great disciples were enabled to see, in his assembly that is, were enabled to see the universe called Sarvaganda Suganda, which is located in the direction of the zenith, straight up, beyond as many Buddha fields as there are sands in 42 Ganges rivers. Or let, let me say Buddha verses in this case, because we're really talking astrophysics here. You know? So Buddha verses, as there are sands in 42 Ganges rivers. There the Tathagata named Gandotamakuta, which means the mountain of supreme scents, you know, perfumes or incenses, Gandotamakuta resides lives and is manifest. In that universe, the trees emit a fragrance that far surpasses all the fragrances, human and divine, of all the Buddha verses of the Ten Directions. In that universe, even the names disciple and solitary sage do not exist. And the Tathagata Gandotamakuta teaches the Dharma to a gathering of bodhisattvas only. In that universe, all the houses, the avenues, the parks, and the palaces are made of various perfumes, and the fragrance of the food eaten by those bodhisattvas pervades immeasurable universes. So in other words, the, and even the bodhisattva, he doesn't mention bodhisattva, bodies are made of perfume. And so it's, everything is like reconstructed in a humanoid, understandable way as all made of perfume, the most exquisite possible you know, fracas, perfume, beyond fracas. At this time, the Tathagata Gandota Makuta sat down with his bodhisattvas to take his meal. And the deities called Gandavyuha Hara, who were all devoted to the Mahayana, served and attended upon that Buddha and his bodhisattvas. Everyone in the gathering at the house of Vimalakirti was able to see distinctly this universe wherein the Tathagata Gandota Makuta and his bodhisattvas were taking their meal. Then the Lichabi Vimalakirti addressed the whole gathering of bodhisattvas. Good sirs, is there any among you who would like to go to that Buddha verse to bring back some food? But restrained by the supernatural power of Manjushri, none of them volunteered to go. So maybe there were some supernormally developed Bodhisattvas, who could have actually tried, gone across the galaxy with the speed of thought, galaxies, nebulas, universes even, with the speed of thought, and brought them back, but they said no. They, in order to, this Manjushri stopped them. He could have himself, but he stopped them to get, let Vimalakirti show something. And what happened? Oh. Hold on. Can you put it a little too low? Yeah, I think I put it too oh, low. Should I, do I have to go back? No, or? no. Just pick up where, where you left off. Okay. Oh, and uh, just noticed, I think you got a little crusty here. What? On both sides. Both sides. Wet it, especially on that side. And a little better, still more. On this really? Side. That was better. Okay. Let's okay. Show. Okay. So Manjushri replied, Then Lichabha Vimalakirti said to the crown prince Manjushri, Manjushri, are you not ashamed of such a gathering? <laughs> Manjushri replied, Noble sir, did not the Tathagata declare, quote, those who are unlearned should not be despised, end quote. Then the Lichabha Vimalakirti said that, I think, to just show his hesitation to perform a miracle. That was the thing. So he said, aren't you ashamed somebody else doesn't do this? And then Mother Sri just gave him a little cliche, a little teasing. And then, <clears throat> and then, uh, then the Lichabha Vimalakirti, without rising from his couch, magically emanated an incarnation bodhisattva 
whose body was of golden color, adorned with the auspicious signs and marks, and of such an appearance that he outshone the whole assembly, like a kind of Superman type of person, or Captain Marvel or something. The Lichavi Vimalakirti addressed that incarnated Bodhisattva, Noble One. The noble son, go in the direction of the zenith, and when you have crossed as many Buddha verses as there are sands in 42 Ganges rivers, very precise geo, <laughs> astro, uh, geo, you know, you know, GPS, you know, APS, astro position, um, positioning. As there are sands in 42 Ganges rivers, you will reach a universe called Sarvaganda Suganda where you will find the Tathagata Gandotama Kuta taking his meal. Go to him, and having bowed down at his feet on my behalf, make the following request of him. The Lichavi Vimalakirti bows and say to him, The Lichavi Vimalakirti bows down 100,000 times at your feet, O Lord, and asks after your health. If you have but little trouble, little discomfort, little unrest, if you are strong, well, without complaint, and living in touch with the supreme happiness. Having thus asked after his health, you should request of him. Vimlakirti asked the Lord to give me the remains of your meal, with which he will accomplish the Buddha work in the universe called Sahar. That's our universe, the tolerable one. Thus, those living beings with inferior aspirations will be inspired with lofty aspirations and the good name of the Tathagata will be celebrated far and wide. Inferior aspirations just means that, not that there's anything inferior about them as potential Buddhas, but it's just that they are so terrified and scared by the cultures and their planet and the sort of therefore collective, you know, um, culture and, and conditioning that they don't think they could be in such a marvelous state as massively blissful at all times and yet completely engaged with everything and everyone and around them. They just don't think that's possible. So therefore they don't have the lofty aspiration to become the infinite being with infinite bliss, infinite love, infinite kindness, infinite compassion that is a Buddha. With many, with many embodiments, there's infinite embodiments, as many as other beings need. Okay. At that, the incarnated Bodhisattva said, they don't give him a name, he's the gopher, I call him the gopher Bodhisattva. There, at that, the incarnated Bodhisattva said, very good, to the Chavavi Malakirti, and obeyed his instructions. In sight of all the Bodhisattvas, he turned his face upward, and was gone, and they saw him no more. When he reached the universe, Sarvaganda Suganda, he bowed down at the feet of the Tathagata Gandotamakuta and said, Lord, the Bodhisattva Vimalakirti, bowing down at the feet of the Lord, greets the Lord, saying, Do you have little trouble, little discomfort, and little unrest? Are you strong, well, without complaint, and living in touch with the supreme bliss of happiness? He then requests, having bowed down 100,000 times at the feet of the Lord, may the Lord be gracious and give to me the remains of his meal in order to accomplish the Buddha work in the universe called Saha. Then and there, those living beings who aspire to inferior ways may gain the intelligence to aspire to the great Dharma of the Buddha, and the name of the Buddha will be celebrated far and wide. At that, the Bodhisattvas of the Buddha field of the Buddha verse of the Tathagata Gandotamakuta were astonished and asked the Tathagata Gandotamakuta, Blessed one, where is there such a great being as this? Where is the universe Saha? What does he mean by those who inspire to inferior ways? Having thus been questioned by those Bodhisattvas, the Tathagata Gandotamakuta said, Noble sons, the universe Noble children, the universe Sahara exists beyond as many Buddha verses in the direction of the nadir, as there are sands in 42 Ganges rivers. There the Tathagata Shakyamuni teaches the Dharma. Ay. It teaches the Dharma to living beings who aspire to inferior ways. 
in that Buddhaverse tainted with five corruptions. There, the Bodhisattva Vimalakirti, who lives in the inconceivable, who himself lives in the inconceivable liberation, teaches the Dharma to the Bodhisattvas. He sends this incarnation Bodhisattva here, me, me myself, under the Buddha. Yeah, this incarnation Bodhisattva here, in order to celebrate my name, in order to show the advantages of this universe, and in order to increase the roots of virtue of these Bodhisattvas, <clears throat> he shows it because. They can see there's such a marvelous way of being, such a marvelous infrastructure as where everything is made of the most exquisite perfumes, including your body and everybody and the trees and the houses and the streets and the Buddha. It's always there with you. It doesn't pass away until it doesn't leave that body. <clears throat> the Bodhisattvas exclaimed, how great must be that Bodhisattva him, be himself if his magical incarnation is thus endowed with supernormal power strength, and fearlessness. The Tathagata said, the greatness of that Bodhisattva is such that he sends magical incarnations to all the Buddha fields of the ten directions, and all these incarnations accomplish the Buddha work for the living beings in all those Buddha verses. Then the Tathagata Gandotamakuta poured some of his food impregnated with all perfumes into a fragrant vessel and gave it to the incarnation bodhisattva. And the 90 million bodhisattvas of that universe volunteered to go along with him. <laughs> I didn't remember there were 90 million. That's quite a crowd. <laughs> Blessed one, they then asked the Sugandakuta, Gandotamakuta, they said, Blessed one, we also would like to go to that universe, Saha, to see, honor, and serve the Buddha Shakyamuni and to see Vimalakirti and those bodhisattvas. The Tathagata declared to them, Noble children, go ahead if you think it is the right time. But lest those living beings become mad and intoxicated, go without your perfumes. And lest those living beings of the Saha world become jealous of you, change your bodies to hide your beauty. And do not conceive ideas of contempt and aversion for that universe. Why? Noble children, a Buddha, Buddha verse is a field of pure space. But the blessed Buddha, in order to develop living beings in just the way they need to be developed, does not reveal all at once the pure realm of the Buddha. Then the incarnation Bodhisattva took the food and departed with the 90 million <laughs> bodhisattvas. And by the power of the Buddha and the supernormal operation of Vimalakirti, disappeared from that universe, Sarvaganda Sugandha, and stood again in the house of Vimalakirti in a fraction of a second. Like whap, you know, no, not even warp drive. Like, like, the, my, like the starship Discovery in the Enterprise, using the mycelial network instant traversal of light years. I love it. The Lichavi Vimalakirti created 90 million lion thrones, exactly like those already there, and the Bodhisattvas were seated. So they sat in these gigantic lion thrones, 90 more, million more of them. Just think where this is going in terms of our normal imagination of space and time. Okay. Then the incarnation Bodhisattva gave the vessel full of food to Vimalakirti, and the fragrance of that food permeated the entire great city of Vaishali, and its sweet perfume spread throughout 100 universes. Oh, therefore, not to speak of all around this planet. This is the morphic resonance incense fragrance, the morphic resonance fragrance of the axial age, if you will. Within the city of Vaishali, the Brahmins, householders, and even the Lichavi chieftain Chandra Chatra, having noticed this fragrance, were amazed and filled with wonder. They were so cleansed in body and mind that they came at once to the house of Vimalakirti, along with all 84,000 of the Lichavis. Oh my goodness. 
Seeing there the Bodhisattva seated on the high, wide, and beautiful lion thrones, they were filled with admiration and great joy. They all bowed down to the, those great disciples and Bodhisattvas and then sat down to one side. And the gods of the earth, the gods of the realm of desire, and the gods of the realm of pure matter, attracted by the perfume, also came to the house of Vimalakirti. Oh my goodness, the, every living being within imaginative reach are all there now, suddenly in the same house. Then the Lachavi Vimalakirti spoke to the elder Shariputra and the great disciples, reverends, noble ones, eat of the food of the Tathagata. It is ambrosia, perfumed by the great compassion. But do not fix your mind in narrow-minded attitudes, lest you be unable to receive its gift. But some of the disciples had already had the thought, how can such a huge multitude eat such a small amount of food? Then the incarnation bodhisattva himself said to those bodhisattvas, those disciples, do not compare venerable ones so respectfully your own wisdom and merits with the wisdom and merits of the Tathagata. Why? For example, the four great oceans might dry up, but this food would never be exhausted. If all living beings were to eat for an aeon an amount of this food equal to Mount Sumeru, the whole planet, in size, it would not be depleted. Why? Issued from inexhaustible morality, concentration, and wisdom, the remains of the food of the Tathagata contained in this vessel cannot be exhausted. Indeed, the entire gathering was satisfied by that food, and the food was not at all depleted. An example of the infinite energy even of yourself, capable of fulfilling all satisfaction of every conceivable infinite being, if you were fully one with it and with them, the way a Buddha is. Indeed, the entire gathering was satisfied by that food, and the food was not at all depleted. Having eaten that food, there arose in the bodies of those bodhisattvas, disciples, chakras, that's indras, brahmas, lokapalas, and other living beings, a bliss just like the bliss of the bodhisattvas of the universe, sarvasukha pratimandita, you know, the complete architecture of universal bliss, pratimandita. And from all the pores of their skin arose a perfume like that of the trees that grow in the universe, Sarvaganda Suganda. They're really, really doing it now. And then the Lichavi Vimalakirti knowingly addressed those bodhisattvas who had come from the Buddha verse of the Blessed One to target the Gandam, Gand Gandota Makuta. Noble sir, you know how does the Tathagata Gandota Makuta teach his Dharma? They replied, the Tathagata does not teach the Dharma by means of sound and language. He disciplines the bodhisattvas only by means of perfumes. I think actually he educates the bodhisattvas only by means of perfumes. At the foot of each perfumed tree sits the bodhisattva, and the trees emit perfumes like this one. From the moment they smell that perfume, the bodhisattvas attain the concentration called source of all bodhisattva virtues. From the moment they attain that concentration, all the bodhisattva virtues are produced in them. Those bodhisattvas then asked Lichabhi Vimalakirti after teach saying that. You know, I, that one thing I, I didn't notice, but, but that means that the Tathagata, of course, is, is the whole land, as well as everybody else who's in it, even those who are bodhisattvas attending to him. He feels he is all of them and, would be, and infinitely beyond. And therefore, his way of teaching is to, as to trees, to admit from the trees his scent. It's such a refined, high-level uh, Buddha land up there in the zenith. <laughs> so then they answered him that way. Everyone else is so satisfied and everything is so, you know, roses, you know. But beyond roses, there's, everything is just, you know, incense. It's just perfume, you know. But they asked the Lichavivi Malakirti, those Bodhisattvas did, how does the Buddha Shakyamuni teach the Dharma? The Malakirti replied, Good sirs, these living beings here are hard to educate, therefore and discipline. 
Therefore, he teaches them with discourses appropriate for the disciplining and educating of the wild and uncivilized. How does he discipline and educate the wild and uncivilized? What discourses are appropriate? Here they are. Quote, this is hell. <laughs> this is the animal world. This is the world of the Lord of death. These are the adversities. These are the rebirths with crippled faculties. These are the physical misdeeds. And these are the retributions for verbal misdeeds. Uh, and the, I'm sorry, and these are the retributions for physical misdeeds. These are verbal misdeeds, and these are the retributions for verbal misdeeds. These are mental misdeeds, and these are the retributions for mental misdeeds, you know, Ten Commandments sort of thing. This is killing. This is stealing. This is sexual misconduct, you know, abuse. This is lying. This is backbiting. This is harsh speech. This is frivolous speech. This is covetousness. This is malice. This is false view. These are their retributions. This is miserliness, and this is its effect. This is immorality. This is hatred. This is sloth. This is the fruit of sloth. This is false wisdom, and this is the fruit of false wisdom. These are the transgressions of the precepts. This is the vow of personal liberation. This should be done, and that should not be done. This is proper, and that should be abandoned. This is an obscuration, and that is without obscuration. This is sin, and that rises above sin. This is the path, and that is the wrong path. This is virtue, and that is evil. This is blameworthy, and that is blameless. This is defiled, and that is immaculate. This is mundane, and that is transcendental. This is compounded, and that is uncompounded. This is addiction, and that is purification. This is life, and that is liberation. Thus, by means of these varied explanations of the Dharma, the Buddha trains the mind of those living beings who are just like wild horses. Just as wild horses or wild elephants will not be tamed unless the good, the goad tamed, meaning disciplined and educated, unless the goad pierces them to the marrow, so living beings who are wild and hard to civilize are disciplined and educated only by means of discourses about all kinds of miseries. The Bodhisattvas said, Thus is established the greatness of the Buddha Shakyamuni. It is marvelous how, concealing his miraculous power, he civilizes the wild living beings who are poor and inferior. And the Bodhisattvas who settle in a Buddhaverse of such intense hardships must have inconceivably great compassion. The Lichabe Vimalakirti declared, So it is, good sirs, it is as you say. The great compassion of the Bodhisattvas who reincarnate here is extremely firm. In a single lifetime in this universe, they accomplish much benefit for living beings. And so much benefit for living beings could not be accomplished in the universe Sarvaganda Sugandha, even in 100,000 aeons. Why? Good sirs, in this Saha universe, there are 10 virtuous practices which do not exist in any other Buddha field. So now he makes a virtue of the lowliness of this world. Notice, they do not exist in any other Buddha verse. What are these 10? Here they are to win the poor by generosity, to win the immoral by morality, to win the hateful by means of tolerance, to win the lazy by means of effort to win the mentally troubled by means of concentration, to win the falsely wise by means of true wisdom, to show those suffering from the eight adversities how to rise above them, to, to teach the Mahayana to those of narrow-minded attitudes, to win those who have not produced the roots of virtue by means of the roots of virtue, and to develop living beings without interruption through the four means of unification, the four social graces. Those who engage in these ten virtuous practices do not exist in any other Buddhaverse. <laughs> really. So we have to be lowly. When we're just at the right level of lowliness, we do some wrong things. Therefore, we can be corrected and help to realize what is real. So because of our vulnerability, that's exactly it. That's why we're better off than the gods of desire and form realms, and formless realms. <clears throat> Bhimalakirti replied, Again, the Bodhisattvas asked, how many qualities and excellences must the Bodhisattva have to go safe and sound to a pure Buddha-verse 
after he or she transmigrates at death away from this Sahar universe. Vimalakirti replied, after he or she transmigrates at death away from the Saha universe, a Bodhisattva must have eight qualities to reach a pure Buddhaverse safe and sound. What are the eight? She must resolve to herself, I must benefit all living beings without seeking even the slightest benefit for myself. I must bear all the miseries of all living beings and give all my accumulated roots of virtue to, give them away to all living beings. I must have no resentment toward any living being. I must rejoice in all bodhisattvas as if they were the teacher. I must not neglect any teachings whether or not I have heard them before. I must control my mind without coveting the gains of others and without taking pride in gains of my own. I must examine my own faults and not blame others for their faults. I must take pleasure in being consciously aware and must truly undertake all virtues. If a bodhisattva has these eight qualities, when he transmigrates at death away from the Saha universe, he will go, she will go safe and sound to a pure Buddhaverse. When the Lichavi Vimalakirti and the Crown Prince Manjushri had thus taught the Dharma to the multitude gathered there, 100,000 living beings conceived the spirit of unexcelled perfect enlightenment, and 10,000 bodhisattvas attained the tolerance of the birthlessness of things. Wonderful. Chapter 9. Now chapter 10. <clears throat> Lesson of the destructible and the indestructible. But just a little bit on the 9. It's so wonderful, isn't it, that the... Uh, uh, that the that the the poor infrastructure of this universe, and therefore the relatively seemingly relatively less good evolutionary karma or karmic evolution of the beings reborn here, needing this little more dualistic type of teaching and a little more fear based reaction to their vulnerability and so on than the more pure more perfected kind of infrastructure place is turned into a virtue there. And then this is going further with that, really, you could say, this particular one. So it's called Lesson of the Destructible and the Indestructible. Meanwhile, the area in which the Blessed One was teaching the Dharma in the Garden of Amrapali expanded and grew larger, and the entire assembly appeared tinged with a golden hue. Thereupon, the venerable Ananda asked the Buddha, Blessed One, this expansion and enlargement of the Garden of Amrapali and this golden hue of the assembly, what do these auspicious signs portend? The Buddha declared, Ananda, these auspicious signs portend that the Lachave Vimalakirti and the Crown Prince Manjushri, attended by a great multitude, are coming into the presence of the Tathagata. And really, what a huge, 90 million bodhisattvas from that other universe, and all the citizens of Vaishali entirely, and besides the huge amount number of people who had already, and gods and supernormal beings who had been there. At that moment, because of the coordination of the oneness of all Buddhas, of course, at that moment, the Lichavi Vimalakirti, said to the Crown Prince Manjushri, Manjushri, let us take these many living beings into the presence of the Blessed One so that they may see the Tathagata and bow down to him. Manjushri replied, Noble sir, send them along if you feel the time is right. Thereupon the Lichabhi Vimalakirti performed the miraculous feat of placing the entire assembly replete with thrones upon his right hand. <laughs> what? He scoops up the content of this TARDIS, which is his house, where they have millions of beings, some of them thousands of miles tall, all clumped together, but without obstructing each other in any way. But then he picks them up in his right hand. And, you know, huh. and then, having transported himself magically into the presence of the Buddha, placed it on the ground, the huge assembly. He bowed down at the feet of the Buddha himself, circumambulated him to the right, leaving him on the right side seven times, 
with palms pressed together and withdrew to one side. The bodhisattvas who had come from the Buddha verse of the Tathagata Gandotama Kuta descended from their lion thrones and, bowing down at the feet of the Buddha, placed their palms together in reverence and withdrew to one side. And the other bodhisattvas, great spiritual heroes and the great disciples, descended from their thrones and likewise, having bowed at the feet of the Buddha, withdrew to one side. Likewise, all those Indras, Brahmas, Lokapalas and gods bowed at the feet of the Buddha and withdrew to one side or went back to their seats on one side. Then the Buddha, having delighted those bodhisattvas with greetings, declared, Noble children, be seated upon your thrones. Thus commanded by the Buddha, they took their thrones. Then Shariputra thought to himself, Then he asked to Shariputra, Oh yeah, then, then, then the Buddha said to Shariputra, Shariputra, did you see the miraculous performances of the Bodhisattvas, those blessed of beings? What concept did you produce toward them? Shariputra replied, Lord, I produced the concept of inconceivability toward them. Their activities appeared inconceivable to me to the point that I was unable to think of them, to judge them, or even to imagine them. <laughs> they were just there. Then the Venerable Ananda asked the Buddha, Lord, what is this perfume, the likes of which I have never smelled before? The Buddha answered, Ananda, this perfume emanates from all the pores of all these bodhisattvas. Shariputra added, Venerable Ananda, this same perfume emanates from all our pores as well. Ananda said, where does the perfume come from? Shari, uh, Shari, Ananda says, and Shariputra answered, the Lichavivimalakirti obtained some food from the universe called Sarva Ganda Suganda, the Buddha verse of the Tathagata Gandotamakuta, and this perfume emanates from the bodies of all those who partook of that food. Then the Venerable Ananda addressed the Lichavivimalakirti, how long will this perfume remain? And Vimalakirti said, until it is digested. And then Ananda said, when will it be digested? And then Vimalakirti said, it will be digested in 49 days, and its perfume will emanate for seven days more after that, but there will be no trouble of indigestion during that time. Furthermore, Reverend Ananda, if mendicants who have not entered destiny for the ultimate eat this food, it will be digested when they enter that destiny. When those who have entered destiny for the ultimate eat this food, it will not be digested until their minds are totally liberated. <coughs> if living beings who have not conceived the spirit of unexcelled perfect enlightenment eat this food, it will be digested when they conceive the spirit of unexcelled perfect enlightenment. If those who have conceived the spirit of perfect enlightenment eat this food, it will be not be digested until they have attained tolerance of birthlessness. And if those who have attained tolerance of birthlessness eat this food, it will not be digested until they have become bodhisattvas one lifetime away from Buddhahood. Reverend like Maitreya, Reverend, An Reverend Ananda, it is like the medicine called delicious, which reaches the stomach but is not digested until all poisons have been eliminated. Only then is it digested. Similarly, Reverend Ananda, this food is not digested until all poisons of the afflictions have been eliminated. Only then is it digested. Then the Venerable Ananda said to the Buddha, Lord, it is, you know, blessed one, it is wonderful that this food accomplishes the work of the Buddha. So it is, Ananda. It is as you say, Ananda. There are Buddha verses that accomplish the Buddha work by means of bodhisattvas, those that do so by means of lights, those that do so by means of the tree of enlightenment, those that do so by means of the physical beauty and the marks of the Tathagata, those that do so by means of religious robes, those that do so by means of food, those that do so by means of water, those that do so by means of gardens, those that do so by means of palaces, those that do so by means of mansions, those that do so by means of magical incarnations, those that do so by means of empty space, and those that do so by means of lights in the sky. Why is it so, Ananda? Because by these various means, 
living beings become disciplined and educated. Similarly, Ananda, there are Buddha fields that accomplish the Buddha verses that accomplish the Buddha work by means of teaching living beings words, definitions, and analogies such as dreams, images, the reflection of the moon in water, echoes, illusions, and mirages, and those that accomplish the Buddha work by making words understandable. And also, Ananda, there are utterly pure Buddha verses that accomplish the Buddha work for living beings without speech, by silence, inexpressibility, and unteachability. Ananda, among all the activities, enjoyments, and practices of the Buddhas, there are none that do not accomplish the Buddha work, because all living beings deserve the Buddha, you know, do not accomplish Buddha work to discipline. Oh, oh I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. Ananda, among all the activities, enjoyments, and practices of the Buddhas, there are none that do not accomplish the Buddha work because all discipline and educate living beings. Finally, Ananda, the Buddha has accomplished the Buddha work by means of the four devils, the Maras, and all the 84,000 types of passion that addict and afflict all living beings. Ananda, this is a Dharma door called Introduction to All the Buddha Qualities and Excellences. The Bodhisattva who enters this Dharma door experiences neither joy, nor pride when confronted by a Buddha verse adorned with the splendor of all noble qualities, and experiences neither sadness nor aversion when confronted by a Buddha verse apparently without that splendor, but in all cases produces a profound reverence for all the Tathagatas, the transcendent ones. Indeed, it is wonderful how all the blessed Buddhas who understand the equality of all things manifest all sorts of Buddha fields and Buddha verses in order to develop living beings. Ananda, just as the Buddha fields and Buddha verses are diverse as to their specific qualities, but have no difference as to the sky that covers them, so, Ananda, the Tathagatas are diverse as to their physical bodies, but do not differ as to their unimpeded Gnostic intuition. Ananda, all the Buddhas are the same as to the per perfection of those Buddha qualities, that is, their forms, their colors, their radiance, their bodies, their marks, their nobility, their morality, their concentration, their wisdom, their liberation, their Gnostic intuition and vision of liberation, their strengths, their fearlessnesses, their special Buddha qualities and excellences, their great love, their great compassion, their helpful, joyous intentions, their attitudes, their practices, their paths, the lengths of their lives, their teaching of the Dharma, their development and liberation of living beings, and their purification of Buddha fields and Buddha verses. Therefore, they are all called Samyaksam Buddhas, Tathagatas, and Buddhas. Ananda, were your life to last an entire eon, it would not be easy for you to understand thoroughly the extensive meaning and precise verbal significance of these three names, Samyaksam Buddha, Tathagata, and Buddha. Also, Ananda, if all the living beings of this billion world galactic universe were like you, the foremost of the learned and the foremost of those endowed with memory and incantations, and were they to devote an entire aeon, they would still be unable to understand completely the exact and extensive meaning of the three words Samyaksam Buddha, Tathagata, and Buddha. Thus, Ananda, the enlightenment of the Buddhas is immeasurable, and the wisdom and eloquence of the Tathagatas are inconceivable. Then the Venerable Ananda addressed the Buddha, Lord, from this day forth, I shall no longer declare myself to be foremost of the learned. The Buddha said, because, you know, Ananda actually was famous among the 500 major arhats or saints, you know, in that having been so much the Buddha's attendant and so close to him, and knowing by heart all the sutras, having a, this, uh, you know, special idiot savant quality of being able to remember everything said to him immediately, you know, just repeat it like a, like a supercomputer recording machine. But he had not attained arhatship himself. He had not taken time for himself to meditate through the eight liberations up into the highest uh, formless realm, back to the 
uh, boundary between formless and form realm and become a perfect Buddha. He had not done that. Or Arhat, he had not done that. And so he, and yet, and so, but, and so he was called learned rather than enlightened, foremost of the wise. Sariputra was called foremost of the wise, but he was called foremost of the learned because, of course, he knew everything. He could repeat everything the Buddha had said. The Buddha said, do not be discouraged, Ananda. Why? I pronounced you, Ananda, the foremost of the learned, with the disciples in mind of the, you know, of the dualistic Buddhism disciples, not considering the bodhisattvas. Look, Ananda, look at the bodhisattvas. They cannot be fathomed even by the wisest of humans. Ananda, one can fathom the depths of the ocean, but one cannot fathom the depths of the wisdom, gnostic intuition, memory, incantations, or eloquence of the bodhisattvas. Ananda, you should remain in equanimity with regard to the deeds of the bodhisattvas. Why? Ananda, these marvels displayed in a single morning by the Lichavivimalakirti could not be performed by the disciples and solitary sages who have attained miraculous powers were they to devote all their powers of incarnation and transformation during 100,000 millions of aeons. <laughs> I didn't even realize until this minute reading to you that all of the things happening at Vimalakirti's house all happened in one morning. Time was compressed, in other words, just as space is compressed inside his TARDIS. Then all those bodhisattvas from the Buddha verse of the Tathagata Gandotama Kuta joined their palms in reverence and, saluting the Tathagata Shakyamuni, addressed him as follows Blessed one, when we first arrived in this Buddha verse, we did conceive a negative idea, but we now abandon this wrong idea. Why? The Lord, uh, blessed one, the realms of the Buddhas and all their skill and liberative art are inconceivable. In order to develop living beings, they manifest such and such a field to suit the desire of such and such a living being. Lord, please give us a teaching by which we may remember you when we have returned to Sarvaganda Suganda. Thus having been requested, the Buddha declared, Noble heirs, there is a liberation of bodhisattvas called destructible and indestructible. You must train yourselves in this liberation. What is it? Destructible refers to compounded things. Indestructible refers to uncompounded things. But the bodhisattva should neither destroy the compounded nor rest in the uncompounded. Not to destroy compounded things consists in not losing the great love, not giving up the great compassion, not forgetting the omniscient mind generated by high resolve, not tiring in the positive development of living beings, not abandoning the means of unification, the social graces, not giving up body and life in order to giving up body and life in order to uphold the holy dharma, never being satisfied with the roots of virtue already accumulated, taking pleasure in skillful dedication, having no laziness in seeking the dharma, being without selfish reticence in teaching the dharma sparing no effort in seeing and worshipping the Tathagatas, being fearless in voluntary reincarnations, being neither proud in success nor bowed in failure, not depending, not despising the unlearned and respecting the learned, as if they were the teach I'm sorry, not despising the unlearned and respecting the learned as if they were the teacher himself, making reasonable those whose passions are excessive, taking pleasure in solitude without being attached to it, not longing for one's own happiness, but longing for the happiness of others, conceiving of trance, meditation, and equanimity as if they were the Avicii hell, <laughs> conceiving of the world as a garden of liberation, considering beggars to be spiritual teachers, considering the giving away of all possessions to be the means of realizing Buddhahood, considering immoral beings to be saviors, considering the transcendences to be patient parents, To, I'm sorry, considering the transcendences to be parents, considering mother and father, that is, considering the aids to enlightenment to be servants, never ceasing accumulation of the roots of virtue, establishing the virtues of all Buddha verses in one's own Buddha verse, 
offering limitless pure sacrifices to fulfill the auspicious marks and signs, adorning body, speech, and mind by refraining from all sins, continuing in reincarnations during immeasurable aeons while purifying body, speech, and mind, avoiding discouragement through spiritual heroism when learning of the immeasurable virtues of the Buddha, wielding the sharp sword of wisdom to chastise the enemy addictions, knowing well the aggregates, the elements, and the sense media in order to bear the burdens of all living beings, blazing with energy to conquer the host of demons, seeking knowledge in order to avoid pride, being content with little desire in order to uphold the Dharma, not mixing with worldly things in order to delight all people, being faultless in all activities in order to conform to all people, producing the super knowledges to actually accomplish all duties of benefit to living beings, acquiring incantations, memory and knowledge in order to retain all learning, understanding the degrees of people's spiritual faculties to dispel the doubts of all living beings, displaying invincible miraculous feats to teach the Dharma, having irresistible speech by acquiring unimpeded eloquence, tasting human and divine success by purifying the path of ten virtues, establishing the path of the pure states of Brahma, by cultivating the four immeasurables, inviting the Buddhas to teach the Dharma, rejoicing in them and applauding them, thereby obtaining the melodious voice of a Buddha, disciplining body, speech, and mind, thus maintaining constant spiritual progress, being without attachment to anything, and thus acquiring the behavior of a Buddha, gathering together the order of bodhisattvas to attract beings to the Mahayana, being consciously aware at all times not to neglect any good, excellent quality, Noble sons, a bodhisattva who thus applies himself to the dharma of the bodhisattva, who does not, do, thus does not destroy the compounded realm. What is not resting in the uncompounded? The bodhisattva practices voidness, but he does not realize voidness. He practices signlessness, but does not realize signlessness. She practices wishlessness, but does not realize wishlessness. She practices non-performance, but does not realize non-performance. She knows impermanence, but is not complacent about her roots of virtue. She considers misery, but she reincarnates voluntarily. She knows selflessness, but she does not waste herself. She considers peacefulness, but does not seek extreme peace. She cherishes solitude, but does not avoid mental and physical efforts. She considers placelessness, but does not abandon the place of good action. She considers occurrencelessness, but undertakes to bear the burdens of all living beings. She considers immaculatelessness, yet she follows the process of the world. He considers motionlessness, yet he moves in order to develop all living beings. He considers selflessness, yet does not abandon the great compassion toward all living beings. She considers birthlessness, yet she does not fall into the ultimate determination of the disciples. She considers vanity, futility, insubstantiality, dependency, and placelessness, yet she establishes herself on merits that are not vain, on knowledge that is not futile, on reflections that are not are substantial, on the striving for the consecration of the independent Gnostic intuition, and on the Buddha lineage in its definitive meaning. Thus, noble sons, a bodhisattva who aspires to such a dharma neither rests in the uncompounded nor destroys the compounded. Therefore, noble heirs, in order to accomplish the store of merit, a bodhisattva does not rest in the uncompounded, and in order to accomplish the store of wisdom, he does not destroy the compounded. In order to fulfill the great love, he does not rest in the uncompounded, and in order to fulfill the great compassion, he does not destroy compounded things. In order to develop living beings, he does not rest in the uncompounded. And in order to aspire to Buddha excellences, he does not destroy compounded things. To perfect the marks of Buddhahood, he does not rest in the uncompounded. And to perfect the Gnostic intuition of omniscience, he does not destroy compounded things. Out of skill and liberative art, he does not rest in the uncompounded. And through thorough analysis with his wisdom, he does not destroy compounded things. To purify the Buddhaverse, 
he does not rest in the uncompounded. And by the power of the grace of the Buddha, he does not destroy compounded things. Because he feels the needs of living beings, he does not rest in the uncompounded. And in order to show truly the meaning of the Dharma, he does not destroy compounded things. Because of his store of roots of virtue, he does not rest in the uncompounded. And because of his instinctive enthusiasm for those roots of virtue, he does not destroy compounded things. To fulfill her prayers, she does not rest in the uncompounded. And because she has no wishes, she does not destroy compounded things. Because her positive thought is pure, she does not rest in the uncompounded. And because her high resolve is pure, her messianic determination is pure, she does not destroy compounded things. In order to play with the five super knowledges and superpowers, she does not rest in the uncompounded. And because of the six super knowledges and superpowers of the Buddha, Buddha Gnostic intuition, he does not dis, she does not destroy compounded things. To fulfill the six transcendences, she does not rest in the uncompounded. And to fulfill the time, she does not destroy compounded things. To gather the treasures of the Dharma, she does not rest in the uncompounded. And because she does not like any narrow-minded teachings, she does not destroy compounded things. Because she gathers all the medicines of the Dharma, she does not rest in the uncompounded. And to apply the medicine of the Dharma appropriately, she does not destroy compounded things. To confirm her commitments, she does not rest in the uncompounded. And to mend any failure of these commitments, she does not destroy compounded things. To, connect, to concoct all the medicines of the Dharma, she does not rest in the uncompounded. And to give out the medicine of even the smallest Dharma, she does not destroy compounded things. Because she knows thoroughly all the sicknesses due to passions, she does not rest in the uncompounded. And in order to cure all sicknesses of all living beings, she does not destroy compounded things. Thus noble heirs, the Bodhisattva does not destroy compounded things and does not rest in the uncompounded. And that is the liberation of bodhisattvas called the destructible and the indestructible. Noble sirs, you should also strive in this. Then those bodhisattvas, having heard this teaching, were satisfied, delighted, and reverent. They were fulfilled with rejoicing and happiness of mind in order to worship the Buddha Shakyamuni and the bodhisattvas of the Saha universe, as well as this teaching they covered the whole earth of this billion world universe with fragrant powder, incense, perfumes, and flowers up to the height of the knees. Having thus regaled the whole retinue of the Tathagata, bowed their heads at the feet of that Buddha and circumambulated him to the right three times. They sang a hymn of praise to him. They then disappeared from this universe and in a split second were back in the universe. Sarvaganda Suganda. So this is the destructible and the indestructible. And we dedicate the merit to everyone becoming equal to both Shakyamuni and the Tathagata Sugandota Makuta and all the Bodhisattvas of the universe, Sarvaganda Suganda. May they all become, may we become like that as quickly as possible. And may all beings become like that as quickly as possible. <laughs>